This is the first in a planned series of videos providing an introduction to harmonics. In these videos, I hope to take you through some of the major issues in the science of harmonics and the elementary mathematics of music. In the process, you will gain insight into the history of music theory and the mathematical structure of musical space. I won't assume too much background knowledge in these videos. You will need to be able to read musical notation, at least well enough to identify notated pitches and intervals. You'll also need some basic mathematics, primarily the ability to manipulate fractions and ratios. Musicians have a tendency to look at mathematics with fear and suspicion, but I think you'll find that if you pay attention, break things down into small steps, and move slowly, you'll be able to understand everything with no problems. In my experience, lack of confidence in one's mathematical abilities is a much larger obstacle than the lack of mathematical ability itself. As we go, I will review some of the mathematical machinery necessary for an understanding of harmonics so that you can still follow along if you haven't done this kind of math in a while. I'll also make sure to break down any calculations step by step and use visual illustrations to make things clearer. If you're having difficulty following along, it's fine to pause or rewind. If you find the explanations too fast-paced, please feel free to say so in the comments. Harmonics is an ancient science, dating back at least as far as the 6th century BC, and probably quite a bit farther. It has little to do with the subjects we group under the name of harmony today, such as chord construction, alteration, and progression. The science of harmonics concerns more elementary questions of the origin of and relations between musical pitches. In practice, this means addressing three main topics. Intervals, the distinction between consonants and dissonance, and the construction of musical systems or scales. As you can imagine, the topics discussed in harmonics are abstract and fairly remote from actual musical practice. Even when we construct systems or scales using the methods of harmonics, we're not entirely sure how, or whether, these structures related to what ancient Greek musicians actually did. If you want to learn more about what music in ancient Greece might have sounded like, you can read Stefan Hagel's book, Ancient Greek Music, A New Technical History. But I will warn you that the evidence about actual ancient Greek music is thin on the ground, and much of what we know is highly speculative. If you're interested in reading more about harmonics, I recommend Thomas Matheson's article in the Cambridge History of Western Music Theory. Advanced readers, especially those with a background in philosophy, mathematics, or classical studies, may want to read Andrew Barker's book, The Science of Harmonics in Classical Greece, for a broader context. By the way, I'll occasionally drop references to further reading in these videos. If you do not have access to an academic library, or are having trouble finding these readings, contact me privately and I may be able to help. Harmonics isn't just a subject of antiquarian interest. It continued to be practiced in some form or other throughout the centuries, intersecting in important ways with the musical thought of composers and theorists such as Sarlino, Lippius, Descartes, Rameau, Riemann, and Schenker. Even today, most music theory textbooks begin with a chapter on harmonics, a chapter which teachers and students routinely skip. But the fundamental mathematical and scientific discoveries of antiquity are still relevant today, at least in any music that uses fixed, recognizable pitches. And throughout the history of music theory, thinkers have appropriated ideas and methods from ancient harmonics, sometimes with surprisingly important consequences for their overall theory. Studying harmonics will therefore be beneficial to anyone interested in music theory or history, classical studies, or the history of mathematics. In the first videos of this series, we're going to go through a text known as the Division of the Canon. Canon is the Greek word for ruler, and the text shows you how to mark off a ruler so that you can find where to stop a stretched string in order to produce the various pitches of the ancient Greek system. Like any ancient text, the division of the canon has a complicated transmission history. The oldest sources we have for the treatise date from the late Byzantine era. In many sources, the treatise is attributed to Euclid, the famous ancient Greek geometer from the 3rd century BC. 
but in some sources it is attributed to someone named Cleonides, and in most sources it is not clearly attributed to anyone. In its long history of being copied, corrupted, and corrected before the invention of the printing press, the treatise has undergone significant evolution. Moreover, it is very possible that the five distinct parts of the treatise did not originate together and were compiled later from other texts, or even that they are extracted from a single larger treatise that hasn't survived. They were not necessarily all written by the same person either. It may be misleading to talk about it as a single document dating from the 3rd century BC. Instead, it might be better to think of the division as a tradition, parts of which may be as old as Euclid's elements, and other parts might be of earlier or more recent origin. One thing we can say for certain is that the division is Euclidean in style. That is, the main body of the text mimics the style and method of Euclid's elements, and at certain points the text actually makes reference to the elements. The elements is presented as a series of propositions, short declarative sentences asserting some mathematical truth, followed by a series of steps proving the proposition to be certainly true. The division is structured in a similar way. The text has 20 propositions. It begins with an introduction outlining the theory of sound that explains the connection between ratios and sounding pitches. The first nine propositions concern the mathematics of ratio rather than musical sound as such. The next seven propositions apply these mathematical truths to musical intervals. The next two propositions concern the enharmonic system of Greek music, which we will discuss later. The treatise closes with instructions for dividing the monochord to produce the diatonic system of Greek music, which we will also discuss later. Again, it's not clear whether these parts originated together, were cobbled together from distinct texts, or were extracted from a larger text. But in some form or other, the division was an influential touchstone for scholars of music and antiquity for centuries. As we look more closely at it, the specific figure of Euclid fades into the background, and we can focus on the ideas discussed in the text, which have been of interest to many people for many reasons throughout the last two millennia. The history of the division may be complicated, but it is not unusual by the standards of classical texts. Andre Barbera points out that, for most Greek texts, we are closer in time to the earliest written sources than the sources are to the purported authors. The kind of hedging caveats I have had to make here apply to all but the most well-transmitted texts of antiquity, and some uncertainty remains even concerning those. If you want to know more about the text of the division and its history, the best thing to read is Andre Barbera's book on the subject. Parts of it are densely technical and meant only for serious classical scholars, but the introductory sections are very accessible to the average reader. Barbera's bibliography points to the most important secondary literature on the subject. There are three English translations of the division available. The first is by Thomas Matheson, published in the 1970s in the Journal of Music Theory. Matheson's translation is good, but it predates much of the scholarship on the division, so it might be outdated at certain points. It's also the most difficult to read of the three translations. The second translation is by Andrew Barker from the second volume of his Anthology of Ancient Greek Musical Writings. This is by far the most accessible translation, and it's the one used in most seminars on ancient music, but in some respects it is misleading even to historians of music theory. I have tried to make this project as independent from Barker's translation as possible. But if you find my presentation unhelpful, it might be useful then to tackle Barker's version. The third and most recent translation is by Andre Barbera. Barbera separates the text into three major versions that have been transmitted in different sources, and he translates all of them along with any major variants. He provides a Greek text on facing pages, running commentary, and a philological apparatus. This is by far the most comprehensive scholarly translation, but it may be intimidating for the casual reader. It's worth taking a glance at, if only to see what a real scholar of ancient Greek music spends all his time working on, but it's not the best version for reading cover to cover. Although I have obviously consulted all three of these translations, this video is not based on any of them too closely. 
My goal is not to present an authoritative text, whatever that may be, but to guide you through the series of steps used in each proposition. To that end, I have felt free to paraphrase from each existing translation, making modifications where appropriate, or rephrasing things entirely. For an introductory video series, I think this approach will work best. I have a master's degree from McGill University, where I studied the relationship between meter and performance as understood in music theory from the early 18th century to the present day. In the process of studying this subject matter, I became interested in the reception of ancient theory by Germans in the late 19th century. Figures such as Rudolf Westphal, Karl Fuchs, and even Friedrich Nietzsche. This led me to a renewed interest in the ancient Greek texts I had studied in translation in my History of Theory seminar. While I'm not a classical scholar, I have an active interest in the work of Greek and Latin writers on music from antiquity. I'm not an authority by any stretch of the imagination, but I do know what I'm talking about, and I'm doing my best to accurately represent the scholarly consensus. If I say anything speculative or controversial, I will make sure to provide a warning. If you have any questions about anything I say in these videos, or if you know better than me and you'd like to offer a correction, you're welcome to do so in the comments section or to contact me privately. Before we actually talk about the Euclidean text, I want to review some fundamental issues of music and mathematics. This will give us the tools we need to approach the treatise knowledgeably. We begin with a fundamental pitch. I'm going to arbitrarily notate this pitch as the G below the treble staff. In this case, and throughout this series of videos, this notation is purely for convenience. The division obviously predates staff notation by many centuries, so it's a complete anachronism to use the treble clef here. But when we're talking about harmonics, only the intervals between the notes are important. The notes themselves are irrelevant. So any notation that is familiar and lets us precisely notate intervals will do the job. Ancient Greek theorists typically talked about musical notes within the span of a two-octave system. Andre Barbera points out that some statements made in the division only make sense if you assume that this two-octave system represents the limit of musical space. It is never stated outright, but the two-octave limit seems to be a tacit assumption of ancient Greek theory. We can fill in this system by finding all the perfect intervals above the fundamental, that is, the perfect fourths and the perfect fifths. These notes complete the outline of the system. In Greek musical parlance, these are the immovable notes. That is, these are the pitches that stay the same no matter which version of the scale we are using. Now let's take a closer look at what intervals the system contains before we add any other notes. These are the main intervals we will deal with in harmonics. From G to C is a fourth. From G to D is a fifth. From G to G is an octave. From fundamental G to the C on the treble staff is an eleventh, that is an octave plus a fourth. From fundamental G to the D on the treble staff is a twelfth, that is an octave plus a fifth. From fundamental G to the G above the treble staff is a double octave. From each D to the next G is a fourth. From each C to its adjacent D is a whole tone. Notice that the two fourth intervals in each octave create empty spaces. Eventually, we are going to fill in these spaces to create a complete scale. The notes represented by the X's are the movable notes, which change in different versions of the scale. We'll discuss these notes in a later video. For the remainder of this video, I want to review some basic issues of acoustics and musical science. With the benefit of modern acoustics and psychology, we now understand pitch as a cognitive phenomenon. That is, when we hear certain kinds of sounds, our minds interpret them as having a particular pitch. Along the path from ear to brain, all sorts of funny business can happen. Psychoacoustic phenomena, such as combination tones, missing fundamentals, and shepherd tones, points to complications that arise somewhere between the physical sound signal and our musical experience. 
Once you add a human brain into the equation, things get complicated. For this account of pitch, I'm going to reduce out the human brain and pretend that perception is uncomplicated. I will assume that we perceive perfectly pure pitches and that nothing interesting happens on the path from the ear to the brain. This isn't true, but it's a useful simplification for our purposes. The ancient Greeks paid little attention to pitch perception, so discussing these issues would take us far from our main topic. Also, it's not a topic I know much about. If this is something you're interested in, I suggest reading some introductory works on music perception and cognition, such as the Oxford Very Short Introduction by Elizabeth Helmuth Margulis. When you pluck a string, it oscillates back and forth in a regular pattern. This series of motions creates a regular disturbance in the air around the string, which is transmitted to your ear, where it causes your eardrums to vibrate. These vibrations are magically translated by your brain into a perception of pitch. When many vibrations occur in a given span of time, we say the pitch is higher. When fewer vibrations occur in the same span of time, the pitch is lower. The rate of a vibration is measured in hertz, or cycles per second. If a string vibrates exactly 100 times per second, we say it is vibrating at 100 hertz. The concert A that orchestras tune to is defined by an international agreement as 440 hertz, that is, a note that contains 440 vibrations per second. It's worth reflecting on how strange this is. When we hear a pitch, it seems to us to be a single, continuous thing with a beginning and end. But the physical signal that causes us to hear a pitch consists of many small movements. When an orchestral oboist plays a tuning note, it seems to me that I hear one thing that nevertheless has a quantity of 440. You could say, in a sense, that I am hearing numbers. Because there is a numerical aspect to pitch, we can compare pitches in the same way we compare numbers, that is, with the mathematics of ratio. Musical intervals consist in ratios between the frequencies of pitches. For example, if two notes are an octave apart, we find that their frequencies will be in a 2 to 1 ratio. The upper note of the octave will vibrate at exactly twice the rate of the lower note. So an octave above concert A would be 880 hertz, while an octave below it would be 220 hertz. Two notes whose frequencies stand in a 3 to 2 ratio will form a perfect fifth. So the E above concert A would be 660 hertz, and the D below concert A would be approximately 293 hertz. Two notes whose frequencies stand in a 4 to 3 ratio will form a perfect fourth. So the D above concert A is approximately 587 hertz. The E below concert A is 330 hertz. Finally, there is the whole tone. You can find a whole tone with the intervals we've already discussed by going up two perfect fifths and subtracting an octave. As an exercise, let's try finding the frequency of the B that stands a whole tone above concert A. We already know that the E above concert A is 660 hertz. Now we need to find the B a fifth above this note. We will do this by using the 3 to 2 ratio. To apply the 3 to 2 ratio, multiply 660 by 3 and then divide by 2. Your result should show that the frequency of the B above the staff is 990 hertz. Now we need to find the frequency of the note an octave below this note. The octave ratio is 2 to 1. To find the frequency an octave above a given frequency, we would multiply by 2. To find the frequency an octave below, we will have to divide by 2. 990 hertz divided by 2 is 495 hertz. This is the frequency of the B above concert A. This practice of navigating to unknown notes by adding and subtracting combinations of perfect intervals is a core part of harmonics. 
when we can find a note through a combination of moves by fourth, fifth, or octave, we say that it is generated by the concords. So we found the frequency for the note that lies a whole tone above concert A. Now using the same math, let's find the frequency ratio for the interval of the whole tone. The ratio for a perfect fifth is 3 to 2. To find the ratio for two perfect fifths stacked on top of each other, or a major ninth, we multiply the 3 to 2 ratio by itself in the same way we would a fraction. This would be 3 to 2 times 3 to 2, which equals 3 squared to 2 squared, which equals 9 to 4. So a perfect fifth plus a perfect fifth, or a 3 to 2 ratio added to a 3 to 2 ratio gives us a 9 to 4 ratio for the major ninth. Now we need to subtract an octave from this ninth to find the whole tone. To subtract one ratio from another, we divide them, just like we would with fractions. The easiest way to divide a fraction or a ratio is to multiply by its inverse. So 9 to 4 divided by 2 to 1 is the same as 9 to 4 times 1 to 2. This gives us a ratio of 9 times 1 to 4 times 2 or 9 to 8. So the ratio of the whole tone is 9 to 8. If this is a little difficult for you to follow, don't worry. We'll review the math necessary for handling ratios in the next video. Now let's return to the system of notes we built earlier. With the interval ratios we've just found, we can calculate most of the notes in our system. Taking the G as the fundamental, we know that the G an octave above will be in a 2 to 1 ratio with the fundamental. The D in the first octave will be in a 3 to 2 ratio with the fundamental. The C in the first octave will be in a 4 to 3 ratio with the fundamental. What about the highest G in our system? We can find it by moving up an octave and then up another octave. Mathematically, we can do this by multiplying the octave ratio by itself. 2 to 1 times 2 to 1 is 4 to 1. We can find the second octave D by moving up a fifth and then up an octave. Mathematically, we multiply the fifth ratio by the octave ratio. 3 to 2 times 2 to 1 is 6 to 2, which we can reduce to 3 to 1. We can find the second octave C by moving up a fourth and then up an octave. Mathematically, we multiply the fourth ratio by the octave ratio. 4 to 3 times 2 to 1 is 8 to 3. I've summarized the interval ratios in this table. It's worth memorizing these ratios because it will make it easier to do calculations with them later. One last note. When we're talking about frequencies, higher numbers mean higher pitches. So A440 is an octave above A220. When we talk about a 2 to 1 ratio of frequencies, the larger number is in reference to the higher note. But there is an inverse relationship between frequencies and string lengths. A long string always produces a lower note than a short string, assuming the string material, thickness, and tension are equal. So the string that produces an A440 would be half the length of a string that produces A220. In a 2 to 1 ratio of string lengths, the larger number is in reference to the lower note, but the longer string. When you're talking about the mathematics of music, an important question to keep in mind is whether we're discussing frequencies, where high numbers mean high notes, or string lengths, where high numbers mean low notes. This concludes the material we need to cover for our introduction to the division. In the next video, we'll delve a little more into the mathematical machinery required to understand the propositions. After that, we'll get started with the propositions themselves. If you found this video helpful, you can help me out by liking, subscribing, and sharing it. I'm working on this project out of personal interest, but it's certainly much easier to stay motivated if I know that people are getting something out of it. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, please feel free to mention them in the comment section. Thank you very much for watching.